Welcome to the sixth module of the SLP's ABC series. This program is Think Readability Instead of Syntax, Tweaking Our Intervention Toward Literacy. This program will focus on the language properties of literacy and the level of syntactic competence necessary for reading comprehension and writing above a third grade level. Interventions we can use to improve comprehension by focusing on syntactic awareness will be presented and an animated PowerPoint approach will be modeled. We hope you enjoy the program and gain an appreciation for the importance of the SLP's role in preventing school failure. All rights reserved. Our opening question is, are you working at this level of language? This is a fourth grade reading passage. Annie followed the teacher's lead, bending, jumping, and she waited for the time when the teacher would lead them in jogging around the playground. When we look at that first sentence, we see that there's an appositive structure. This is a sentence or a clause that's introduced to give a little more information in terms of what teacher's lead means. And conjunction, she waited, prepositional phrase, for the time. We have a WH adverbial conjunction, when the teacher, a modal verb, would lead them in jogging around. So there's a prepositional phrase, the playground. So we have a multiple prepositional phrases and several different kinds of clauses. Let's look at the second one. It starts out with as. This is a conjunction because a sentence, a simple sentence, starts with a noun phrase. So we know that there's been a clausal movement, that the original sentence was probably later on. She picked up a shoe and hid it in the folds of her dress as Annie jogged around jogged past the spot where the teacher's shoes lay on the ground. So we have a conjunction, we have a clausal movement, we have past, um, which is functioning as a prepositional phrase, which is an unusual use of that word, w, another WH adverbial conjunction where the teacher's shoes lay on the ground. She picked up up is not a preposition, but rather a particle or part of the verb, and hid it in the folds of her dress. So we've got a prepositional phrase here and a prepositional phrase here. And when Annie jogged past a trash can, she dropped the shoe inside. Once again, we've got a conjunction and a WH adverbial. These start the sentence, which means that it's been a clausal movement because of the typical sentence starts with a noun phrase. So she dropped the shoe inside and when Annie jogged past the trash can. So it's going to be and is linking it to this sentence and the when is the WH adverbial conjunction that links these two sentences together. She dropped the shoe inside when Annie jogged past a trash can. So we've got this and conjunction that's feeding back to the prior sentence and this one that's linking these two ideas together. So we can go through all of these sentences and we'll see all kinds of different kinds of conjunctions and relative clauses and adverbial clauses and prepositional phrases and infinitive clauses and ellipsis and lots of different kinds of grammatical complexity. So if you're not working at this level of language, then you basically are not working at a high enough level of syntactic difficulty to help your children with reading comprehension and word recognition. You have to be working at a great appropriate level for the students to um, be able to use the literate language of the classroom. Okay, so what do we know about developing syntactic maturity? At each grade level, children acquire the ability to process increasingly more complex sentences like the ones we just looked at. They acquire grammatical structures, forms, and strategies. This results in more sophisticated language and more precise ways of using language. So you're expected to speak in more literate language and less oral language as you move up through the grade levels. And you're supposed to be able to follow the instructions and the lectures given by the teachers. 
So we use these for reading, for writing, and for listening to academic forms of discourse, such as lectures. If you are getting behind in learning these complex grammatical structures, it's going to affect everything in your school day. So what does literate language look like? As we've shown, longer, more embedded and conjoined utterances, more abstract vocabulary, more complex discourse structures that we studied in the last two modules, narrative discourse and expository discourse structures, we find that syntactic complexity is one of the primary measures of readability, or what's at a third grade level, what is expected at a fourth grade level, what's expected at a twelfth grade level. Those are going to be determined by readability formulas, and syntax, as we'll see, is one of the primary measures of what's difficult or what makes things at a higher readability level. It increases with each grade level, and by fourth grade exceeds the grammatical complexity of typical conversational language. We talk about kindergarten first through third grade as being learning to read, and after third grade you're expected to have the principles of reading down, and you are supposed to be now reading to learn, and that includes learning more complex language structures. But if you've got children who have been slow to catch on to reading, um, and they are struggling with the reading comprehension, then by fourth grade they're going to stop, they're going to start losing comprehension, really struggling with reading, and are likely to plateau between a fourth and a fifth grade reading level. As they move on into high school, they don't have the language skills to cope with the text that they're expected to read, so it's impossible to keep up with the class, and then we have kids who drop out. And that's the whole purpose of this grant, is for speech pathologists to be more aware of what it takes to keep these kids in schools and to tweak our interventions towards literacy so that we can do our part to make sure that we help these children turn this around and stay in school. Again, examples of morphology and syntax that are acquired during the school year, school age years. Um, a lot of inflectional prefixes, so there are many, many, many prefixes like contra, hypo, anti, dis, miss, un, um, dozens of different kinds of prefixes that need to be understood and, and recognized more of the derivational suffixes that change one part of speech into another part of speech. These allow our language to be very efficient. I don't have to have new vocabulary words for something like quick versus quickly. I can turn that adjective into an adverb just by adding a morpheme, or I can turn something into a noun so satisfy a verb into satisfaction into a noun. I can, you know, use my existing vocabulary, but create new grammatical uses of that word if I can master the derivational suffix system. Sentence length and complexity increase. We get much more elaborate noun phrases and verb phrases. So verb phrases might have modal verbs and perfect tense verb or aspect and um, auxiliary verb, so we could have, he might have been going to school, okay, might have been and go and ing. So long elaborate verb phrases or noun phrases that can have articles, demonstratives, adjectives, um, conjunctions, so the big yellow cat and the small black dog were best friends. So basically, elaboration of the noun phrase and the verb phrase. Reflexive pronouns are mastered. We start to see a much greater use of adverbs, and then they also are moved to the front of the sentence. So we saw some of those examples where the adverbs or the adverbial phrase or even conjunctions that function as adverbial phrases were moved to the front of the sentence. Um, because basically it allows greater emphasis on the how, the when, the where, the why, or the how often information if we move it to the front of the sentence. So if we said he walked quickly, it doesn't have the same impact as quickly he walked. So it puts the semantic emphasis on the speed or how he did it. And so that's why the more literate the language, the more of these clauses get moved to the front of the sentence. But that makes it less predictable who 
for kids who don't have good language. They're expecting a noun phrase, and that when they don't encounter the noun phrase, then it throws off their comprehension and makes it more difficult to process. And they can't see because the conjunctions, for example, are at the beginning of a sentence instead of between the two sentences. They lose track in short-term memory of what what how these ideas go together and, and what two ideas meld if they don't have great competence with these language forms. And we also see gerunds where things that look like verbs are actually nouns. Running is difficult. Other forms of more sophisticated syntax include passive sentences center embedded sentences, the cat that chased the rat ate the cheese. So we had the cat ate the cheese and we inserted a whole other sentence into it. <coughs> the cat chased the rat. Subordinating conjunctions, here's a whole list of things that we may not think of as conjunctions in that rather than where until Generally, oral syntactic development is completed by adolescents, so students have a good handle on these derivational morphemes and different kinds of prefixes. They understand complex sentences and can produce complex sentences. So in typical development, we see that the syntactic development is completed by adolescents, while written syntax may gain in complexity throughout adulthood, particularly if you're in a position occupationally where you write a lot. However, this is not going to be true for our kids with language disorders whose development is very much delayed by adolescence and they end up dropping out of school. All right, we talked about readability as being a measure of syntactic ability at school age. So we have M MLU during the preschool years and then what is readability and how can that help us get a handle on what's grade appropriate or age appropriate syntax. A definition of readability is the ease at which a document can be read. They are mathematical formulas just like MLUs are mathematical formulas. They assess the suitability of a book for the age and grade level of the student and they use the complexity of the language as their measure of suitability. It focuses only on the form, so just like MLU only counts the, the words and the morphemes, this is going to do a similar type of thing. It's only going to count things. So it doesn't address the content. It doesn't tell if the book's fit to be read, if it's interesting, agreeable, enjoyable, only the difficulty level of the words. It also doesn't assess the use on whether it's actually a useful expository text, for example, telling us how to build a cake or build a birdhouse. It's only the form. It's just counting the raw data. Most readability formulas are going to measure a semantic factor or the difficulty of the words and a syntactic factor or the difficulty of the sentences. So those are the two basic things that are measured. A word difficulty measure, a syntactic difficulty measure. Other readability formulas do count other types of things, but the research shows that they really don't make the formula any more predictive of reading ease, and they take a lot more effort. In terms of a semantic factor or the difficulty of words, they're either measured against a frequency list, okay, so the Dulce words, for example, um, or graded level words, so first grade words, the, the number of first grade level words, second grade level words, third grade level words, etc. So a frequency list of how frequently the words are used in a language tends to be in, inversely correlated to how difficult the word is. So less frequently used words tend to be more scientific, more abstract, and so they're more difficult words. The other way of measuring the semantic or the difficulty of words is by the length of the word, and those are measured either in characters or in syllables. And then the sentences or the syntax is measured for the average length of characters or words. 
So depending on which formula you use, it's going to be some combination of these kinds of factors. And these are some of the popular formulas. The fog index gives you a grade level. The flesh scale is the most widely used. It gives you the readability level and the ease of comprehension measures. So it's another type of measure that says this is written in plain language and so it's going to be easier to comprehend as opposed to language that gets to be too mm, dense. Dale Chall computes sentence length and words not on the D Dale Chall 3000 easy word list. So if it's the words are not on the 3000 easy word list, then they're going to be con considered difficult words. So the number of words that are not on that list. Fry readability um, uses a plot instead of a calculation, and so the plot does the work for you. Closed procedure is also used, including the Dibbles Next. Um, if you can't predict the missing words, then the text is too difficult. So let's look at the, the readability and how we measure syntax. We're going to use the fry because it has the visual graph. So the instructions are to start at the beginning of the passage and count out 100 words. So you just start counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. A word is any group of symbols with a space on either side. The following would be counted as words. Joe is a word, UIC is a word, a word. 1945 is a word, and is a word, etc. is a word. And then you count the number of sentences as in, sentences in that 100-word passage. If the passage ends in the middle of a sentence, then estimate the length to the last sentence to the nearest tenth. So it's about two and a third sentences per 100 words, or four and a half sentences per 100 words. Let's go up to my sentence here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, so if sixteen was the act the act the average sentence length, then we would have um About five words per sentence, 4.5, 5.5. Okay, so let's do something simpler. Start with a real simple one here. We have Tony lived in a zoo, he was a lion, he was a friendly lion, a bird came to his cage. And then we would continue on until we used up 100 words. So, so far we've used 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we would have to add 80 more words to our sample. And now we're just going to count the words. Tony lived in a zoo, gives us 5. He was a lion, gives us 4. He was a friendly lion, gives us 5. A bird came to his cage, gives us 6. And so if we continued this, and the rest of the sentences were approximately this length, we would end up with 20 sentences. And so that would get plotted on our graph. So here's our graph. We locate 20 sentences on the graph. And that ends up right there at the top of the graph. And that tells us this, this the sentence structure is very simple. It took 20 sentences to use up 100 words. So that's only about five sentences, or five words, I'm sorry, per sentence. The second measure is going to be vocabulary and morphology. So on the Fry readability, you count the number of syllables in the 100 word passage. Syllables correspond to jaw movements. It's how I always teach the kids um, to listen for syllables. If you touch your jaw and feel it drop, syllable correspond jaw movement. You can feel the jaw move. It's, it's the speech or the phonemes that are produced in one jaw movement, basically. 
Some teachers have the kids clap out syllables, but to me, I like it closely related to speech, since that's what it actually represents. Also, you, there are as many syllables as there are vowel sounds. So when you look at vowel sounds, there's one vowel sound here. Here there are two vowel sounds. Here there are three vowel sounds. Here there are two vowel sounds, and that can give you a visual image of how many syllables there are. But you have to know your rules, such as two vowels making the owl sound. So you can't just count the vowels. It has to be the vowel sounds. And you count one syllable for each symbol. So 1945 is actually counted as four syllables. The ampersand is counted as one syllable. Then on the graph, you find the number of syllables. Mark the spot where the syllables in the sentences intersect. And this is the approximate grade level of the passage. On this graph, if the lines meet in the gray area, then the measurement is not accurate, and you have to go further into your story and try another passage. Vocabulary and morphology is basically a good measure of language because in English, the word length is closely tied to the abstractness of the word. This was discovered by Ziff in 1935, who said that longer words occur less frequently, so he started studying word structure. And he found that word length is closely related to the psychobiology of language, that words referring to concrete observable objects and events were the first to come out and be used in the language, especially in a language like English that's more phoneme structured rather than syllable structured. So basically anything that you think of as being really concrete and observable. So if you think of body parts, hand, foot, leg, arm, head, knee, toe, etc. Those things tend to be one syllable. Plate, cup, fork, spoon, um, dog, cat, the you know basic animals, fish that we see all the time tend to be one syllable words. Whereas things that are more abstract, so shoulder, elbow, um, sternum, are going to be more than one syllable. And we also, Ziff also found that those were most often, often represented by CBC, CV, or VC syllable structures. And then as we moved into more abstract words, we started adding blends. And so we might have CC or CCCVC or CVCC. So again, the simplest words also have the simplest phonetic structure within the syllable. Um, derivational morphemes also add syllables to words. So when you have the simple inflectional morphemes like plurals, dog, dogs, it does not add another syllable. But when you have something like a derivational suffix, um, such as satisfy, satisfaction, or um, ev evident evidence, then very often another syllable gets added. So this is just a little example of looking at these levels of semantics. We have a label for dog, and that's just a CVC. We have an attribute, we'll call him a hound, and now we see that we're getting more complex. It's still a one-syllable word, but we're getting more complex phonetic structure when the word is a little bit more difficult or a little bit more abstract. For an interpretation, smart. We say that the dog is smart. And now our concept is a little more abstract. We're talking about some sort of mental state that we impose on the dog by looking at his behaviors. And we see that the syllable structure is, again, getting a little more complex. If we get up to the inference level, we could say that this dog is a champion. And now we're seeing not only more syllable structures, but more syllables themselves, cham, p, n. And when we get up to the evaluation level and say that this is a domesticated animal, then we have lots of syllables. So the more abstract the word in English, the more morphemes the word tends to have, the more 
you're going to see the syllable structure include more syllables and more complex syllables. Here's some other examples. Dog is the basic word. Spaniel is the more precise word. And that spaniel is going to have more syllables. Shy is the basic observation. Submissive is making an evaluation of that shy behavior. Um, and it's a more complex word that's going to have more syllable structures. We talked a little bit about derivational morphemes. They can appear as prefixes or suffixes in English. They do change the part of speech, although some such as some prefixes don't. They can add one or more syllable to syllables to a word. And as we said, they're just efficient in a language because you don't have to have a brand new vocabulary word. You can just add a morpheme, a derivational morpheme, and use it grammatically in a different part of the sentence. So we can change an adjective to a noun by adding an NESS. So slow is the vocabulary word and I can turn it into a noun slowness. Here's an adjective to a verb. Modern is my adjective. Modernize is my verb. I can turn, change a verb to a noun or in, then into an adjective. Um, recreate, recreation turns it into a noun. Recreational turns it into an adjective. Noun to verb, phi, glory, glorify, verb to adjective, able, drink, drinkable, or turn a verb into a noun with ants, deliver, deliver ants. All right, so let's do our syllable count now for the fry readability. Now that we've discussed the property of increasing syllables, creating increasing complexity semantically. All right, so Tony lived in a zoo. So Tony has two syllables, so now that's giving us a count of six. He was a lion. So cat would be the base word. Lion is a little more complex. That gives us five. He was a friendly lion. Now we've got that adverbial morpheme, L-Y, derivational morpheme. That gives us seven. A bird came to his cage. And these are all just basic level words, so they only have one syllable. So that gives us a count of six. So if we continued the story and the sentences were similar to this, we would end up, if I would have put out the whole 100 word passage, it would have ended up with 112 syllables. So now we've already plotted our sentence, our 20 sentences, to consume our 100 words. And now we're going to look at our number of um, syllables per 100 words, and it comes out to 112 syllables which is pretty low, meaning the vocabulary is simple, a lot of basic level words. So out of 100 words, only 12 of them had more than one syllable. And so now where these two lines intersect is going to be our readability level. So this one is going to be at the PP or preprimer level, and that's the very beginning first grade level, end of kindergarten level, where children first start learning to read. Then there's the primer level, or the primer level, which is going to be mid first grade, and then finally the first grade level. Going on to an example of a slightly higher level, this is a third grade passage. And again, I want to look at the syntax of this and how this has changed from the little Tony story, where in the Tony story, Tony lived in a zoo. We just have our noun, our verb, our prepositional phrase, our noun, our verb, our noun phrase, our noun, our verb, our noun phrase. We have our noun, our verb, and then we have a prepositional phrase. So everything is in what Chomsky would call phrase structure grammar, simple phrases. By third grade, the story has changed quite a bit. By September. Now remember, if it doesn't start with a noun, that means that there's been clause movement, which is often 
indicated with a comma. So by September is going to be a prepositional phrase. So a prepositional phrase has been moved from somewhere else in the sentence. Let's find it. Julie had trained for months for this race, and she hoped that she and her dogs would win by September where she had trained for months for this race by September. It's probably right here. And then it got moved to the beginning of the sentence. Julie had trained, so a complex verb phrase, for months, preposition for this race, and conjunction. She hoped, now look, here's my verb. She hoped she and her dogs would win. And so now we've got another verb. So she hoped that she and her dogs would win. So we really have several sentences here. So let's look at it. Julie had trained for months. Julie had trained for this race. Julie had trained by September. So we can get rid of, according to Chomsky, we can get rid of any of that redundant information. So we end up with Julie had trained for months for this race by September. And then I can move that to the beginning of the sentence. By September, Julie had trained for months for this race. And, so now we're starting a whole nother complex sentence that we're going to add together. She hoped something. Julie would so it's Julie hoped something, Julie would win. Um, and so basically, and her dogs would win. So now we have substitutions of pronouns for each of those nouns. We have this relative clause that's going to take this, this um, undefined pronoun something and give it definition with future sentences. Um, and then we have a conjunction, since they're both going to win, we're going to compress those into one sentence. So it's going to end up with, she hoped, so Julie hoped, Julie and Julie's dogs would win. And then we changed all of those Julies into pronouns to refer back to Julie, since she's the agent in all of those things. Okay, so again, you can see how dramatically more difficult third grade reading is compared to first grade reading. First grade reading would have left each of these sentences in the simple form. Third grade reading is using all of these transformations that allow us to combine, embed, and delete things. So let's look at the readability in this case. We ended up with 16 words, 4 words, 18 words, so an average of 13 words per sentence, which is about 7.6 sentences for 100 words, and 117, almost 118 syllables. So now when we plot out those 117, almost 118 syllables, you can see it's plotting out near the third grade level. And when we plot out 7.6 sentences per 100 words, it's also plotting out in that late third grade area. This is the gray area they were talking about. If your plot comes over here, then it just means the sentences that you picked, those 100 words, were for some reason skewed in some way, and so pick a different passage. So that's how the Fry readability works, but it does a nice job of differentiating what first grade reading looks like versus third grade reading. It indicates that the sentences have conjunctions, relative clauses, infinitives, and idioms. And the vocabulary requires background knowledge. Words like shape, day after day, have specific meanings in this passage. Now, if you don't want to calculate the readability by hand, there are two easy ways to do it. Word documents will do it for you. So you can type in 100 words into a Word document. And then you set your Word for calculating readability. And this is what it basically gives you. It gives you the number of words, the number of characters, the number of paragraphs, the number of sentences the average sentences per paragraph, the average words per sentence, the average characters per word, and it uses the Fletch reading readability ease and also the grade level, re the readability grade level of 5.3 for this particular passage. To get my Word document to do this, you click on the Microsoft Office button 
and then you click word options and then you check then then you click proofing and then you make sure that the grammar and spelling is selected and then when correcting for grammar in Word, you make sure that you click off Show Readability Statistics and it will immediately start calculating your readability statistics. So then you just go into the review and review for grammar and one of the statistics that pops up is this readability. So you can do it on any document or any part of a document. I can basically um, just do control. I can you know, just... Um, rah. I can take um, put line put a block. That's what I'm looking for. You can put a block around any group of words. It doesn't have to be the whole paper. You can just block any group of words or any part of the passage, and you can do that readability check on just that part of the passage. Or you can load up any one of these readability formulas: flesh reading ease, flesh reading level, the fog scale, the smog index, the Coleman something index, the readability index, etc. So they've got five or they've got seven different kinds of readability formulas here at this particular website for free. And so you basically just copy and paste your passage in here and tell it which formula you want it to use and it'll calculate the readability for you. It also gives you great information about what they are and how to use them and got guidelines to calculating, etc. So it gives you a lot of information about what readability is. Okay, so what do we know about language and reading beyond what we've talked about? Well, there's a lot of studies and it grows all the time that shows there's a very strong relationship between your language skills and both reading decoding and comprehension. So written language is just written language written down in a different code. And so basically whatever your language skills are and whatever language weaknesses you have, they're going to be brought to that reading process. Um, if you've got the poor meta skills, it'll affect the decoding um, and also the comprehension. If you're not finding those patterns of syntax and morphology and text as we looked at the last couple of weeks, then it's going to affect um, your comprehension as well as your fluency of reading. So when kids have poor fluency and poor comprehension, it means that their language skills are not supporting the reading that they're trying to um, comprehend. And you can just hear it, you know, their intonation is wrong, they're pausing in the wrong place, they're making miscues as they try to make sense of the text that don't fit the actual decoding skills even though they are okay at decoding. Those are all examples of losing the language meaning and trying to compensate which results in errors. Um, in both reading and spelling the child has to have morphological awareness. So you start to have to become aware of the ED markers and the S markers and the shun markers etc. so that you're not treating it like a phoneme and just trying to read it as a you know a word, the, one of the letters of the word, but you have to recognize it as an actual morpheme. And again we're going to have dialect users who don't use those morphemes in their dialect or at least they you know, use them in different variations than standard English. And so basically we're going to have kids that are going to not understand or recognize the patterns for a lot of those. Syntax is you know, our main focus today and it has a huge role in reading comprehension and reading fluency. So once again, more the syntactic awareness. Poor readers have difficulty detecting and correcting syntactic errors. So when they speak a syntactically incorrect utterance or when they hear others speak a syntactically incorrect utterance, it doesn't register as being an error. They do very poor on those kinds of tests on instruments like the told. Um, they don't catch it in their own reading. They don't catch it in their own writing. They're very poor at detecting and correcting syntactic errors. Early on, preschoolers with syntactic delays, so those of you who have the little guys who are having difficulty acquiring brown stages, are at high risk for later reading problems. Whatever is interfering with finding those syntactic patterns as preschoolers does not go away, and they're going to have that same kind of difficulty figuring out all of these complex 
syntactic structures that increase in length and complexity with each grade level. Syntactic awareness at first grade predicts word recognition at second grade, even after accounting for phonemic awareness and general learning abilities. So syntactic awareness is not just part of a lower IQ or a, you know learning disability um, or poor phonemic awareness. It's you know a skill that adds more understanding to why our children are reading at a poor level. It's not enough to just treat the phonemic awareness. We also have to treat the syntactic patterns and the syntactic awareness. And then dyslexic readers are notoriously bad with syntactic processing. And it's, again, we aren't even on the teams, which drives me crazy. We're not even on the teams for identification of dyslexia, even though it's defined as a language disorder. And even though we have decades of literature showing the language deficits of these kids, we aren't part of the team and we often aren't part of the intervention team. When the problem is not addressed, as it is not in school, what we see is the Matthew effect, first used by Loban in 1976. The Matthew effect is a phrase that comes from the Bible, but it basically means the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. So those who start out with less syntactic awareness are going to be the poorer readers, as we just showed. When you are the poor reader, then you don't read very much, and when you do read, you don't find those new patterns and so you get very frustrated because you lose comprehension. So that means you're not learning the new syntactic structures as you read and so you start getting that snowball effect. The ones who have the great syntactic awareness read, they're aware, they see a structure that they're not familiar with and so they slow down their reading, they pay attention to it until they figure it out, they acquire those patterns just by reading and they increase their reading skill. They get richer. Those who start out with less syntactic awareness also tend to have less syntactic competence. So when they read and they fail to comprehend, they don't use strategies to try to learn these. They don't even see the patterns. And so they have the snowball effect where things get worse and worse and worse. And again, you top out at about a fourth to fifth grade reading level. Every time I work with poor readers, I always start at about a fourth grade reading level, whether they're in fourth grade or whether they're in 12th grade, because they're basically going to be stuck at about that same place. Teachers are not trained to recognize or teach language processes. They're not even aware that they need to. Um, it's not in the literature, the idea that syntax is an important part. When you look at the, you know, um, no child left behind types of things, it's phonemic awareness, vocabulary, reading fluency, which does not, is really a syntactic measure, but it's not mentioned as a syntactic measure. And then people have kids do choral reading and that kind of superficial training to try to increase the fluency rather than understanding that it really has to do with this complex language that the kids can't process. Um, so it's not even part of what's considered to be important. And then comprehension, again, is basically this generic kind of thing that doesn't recognize that one of the primary reasons why we're not comprehending is because we can't process the complex syntax and morphology as well as the abstract vocabulary. So even with individual training, few teachers understand language at a level where they can teach using classroom materials. So when there have been studies where we try to teach classroom teachers to process it, they don't think language. They haven't had courses in language development. They haven't had courses in linguistics. They haven't had courses in you know, how to process language and how to teach language structures, etc. How, you know, to count morphemes, etc. And so basically the classroom teacher is not the ideal person to actually address these problems. It really is the speech language pathologist. We're the ones that have the language training. But unless you go to LSU and or a couple of other programs, you're not going to be given a class on literacy and how to use literacy to teach higher level language. And so we've got a lot of speech language pathologists, not only in Louisiana, but nationwide, who don't have a good literacy background beyond using picture books. So we do pretty well with the little guys, but not after second or third grade. 
What do we know about this Matthews effect? We said that was a, a term that was twined coined by Walter Loven. And so where did he get this idea of the Matthew effect? Well, this is all profiled in his book, Language Development, Kindergarten through Grade 12, where he did this amazing study, lifelong work, where he did a longitudinal analysis of oral and written language development. So he followed 211 students for 13 years. I mean, no kidding, 13 years he followed these kids from kindergarten through grade 12. He took oral language samples every single year, and he took writing samples after third grade, so from third grade through twelfth grade. So as soon as they could write, he started taking writing samples as well. He used a variety of other measures, like teachers' rating of the children's achievement, their IQ scores, their reading scores, their listening scores, and various standardized language measures. He discovered that written and oral language developed in parallel but that the trends observed in written language were actually seen about a year earlier in oral language samples. So he would see some of these complex language forms emerge in oral language, and a year later he would see them emerge in the children's written language, or their writing samples. These are some examples of some of his charts and the difference between the high achievers versus the low achievers. So at first grade, in terms of the number of words, so we looked at the number of words with our readability formula. So he looked at the number of words in oral sentences from the transcripts as well as their written language. And you see that in the higher achieving kids come in with about two words longer in their sentences and the lower achieving kids never catch up. So by sixth grade, the high achieving kids are using 10.3 words per sentence, and you don't see that until 12th grade in the low achieving students. So there's six grade levels lag in terms of syntactic complexity. In written language at third grade, when he started collecting they had enough writing skills that they could actually write, so he started collecting those things, and you see the same sort of profile that the third graders with high skills were writing with about 7.7 .7 words as opposed to the 5.7 words for the low achievers, and that they never really caught up until 11th or 12th grade. They caught up with what the 8th graders were doing. So by 8th grade, the high kids were using 11.2, and it wasn't until 11th and 12th grade that the low achievers who were still in school started to use that level of syntactic complexity. Similarly, the words in dependent clauses, so all the relative clauses and the um, adverbial WH, WH, adverbial clauses, etc. By first grade, these kids in their oral language were already using lots of them, 16 words that were found in dependent clauses as opposed to nine words for the low achieving kids. By eighth grade, these guys were using 27 words as opposed to 18 to 20. Um, and then this level of 27 words wasn't seen until 12th grade for the low achievers. In written language, you, the differences were even more profound. So by fourth grade, high achievers were pretty good little writers already, and they had 19 words in dependent clauses as opposed to four for the low achievers. Um, and then, you know, basically the high achievers, they sort of evened out over here. Um, some of them were starting to use more of those dependent clauses, but in general, they weren't as competent. So, what did Loben conclude about his low achievers? They started out lower in oral and written syntax and never caught up. They had fewer embeddings. They had fewer of every type of clause within com complex sentences. They had less elaboration of noun and verb phrases, so even the simple things like a noun phrase or a verb phrase were far, sim were far simpler. Fewer words, fewer morphological and derivational inflections um, for the low achievers. They had a slower rate of gain than their higher achieving peers, so they got further behind every year. And so that's when he coined the Matthew effect. The less you read, the less opportunity to acquire the higher level things. And then even when you do read, comprehension is more difficult or impaired, so you get very frustrated 
it takes you twice as long to read something and comprehend it. You might have to read it three or four times compared to your higher achieving peers. And eventually the kids just give up and drop out of school. And this is what we need to fight to prevent. So syntactic awareness. We were talking about how syntactic awareness at first grade predicts later achievement in reading and reading comprehension. So what's our definition of syntactic awareness? It is awareness of the syntactic structure of sentences and the ability to reflect on and manipulate that structure. So it's very similar to things like phonemic awareness, where you have to become aware of the structure of phonemes and words. Now we have to become aware of the structure of sentences and reflect on think about it and manipulate that structure. So we talk about, you know, changing in a word, changing the B to a P. Now what word do we have for rhyming? For example, that would be an example of manipulating. And for manipulating the structure and syntax, it's that ability to say, oh, I really want to talk about the speed of the action. So I'm going to move the word quickly to the front of the sentence, because that's going to give me that quality of speed as soon as I start reading. So that's an example of manipulating the structure. Uh, one of the really nice studies was uh, Maktari and Thompson. So they use this, the told three sentence combining task, which requires children to manipulate the structure of sentences. So they use word ordering and grammatical competence. And they looked at fifth grade students and their level of syntactic awareness, and they compared that to their reading fluency and comprehension. So two of those measures that I said really reflected whether you're processing the syntax or not. And they found that the level of syntactic awareness, not surprising, <laughs> had a very strong correlation to reading fluency and an even stronger correlation to reading comprehension. So once again, it's like if you are not aware of and cannot process that level of sentence where things get moved around or combined or deleted from the sentences, you're going to lose fluency, you're going to lose comprehension and really showed it well in this particular study. There are many other studies that show that children with comprehension problems have some weak syntactic awareness. So it suggests that poor comprehenders have difficulties that extend beyond problems with reading comprehension to more general weaknesses with language processing. So again, these problems of comprehension are language processing problems and not just word recognition or fluency problems that can be fixed by choral reading where you learn to read with the same intonation as the teacher. It's like the reason you can't read with good intonation is because you're reading according to your own syntax, which is simpler than the syntax of the text that you're trying to read. So you're trying to make it fit a pattern of syntax that does, isn't the same as the complex one that's written there. So the implications. If lower levels of syntactic awareness correspond with poor reading fluency and poor comprehension, then we need to increase that syntactic awareness. And if we do that, it should increase reading ability. So for the next few minutes, we're going to do a little quick tutorial, remind you of syntactic complexity. When we looked at the first grade reading passages, Tony was a lion. It fit this basic sentence structure pattern. He was a friendly lion. Tony went in the house, prepositional phrase. Okay, so that's going to be your basic sentence structure. Um, a lot of the visualization things that I do are because of my helping my dyslexic grandson Austin when he was in school. So one of the things that he couldn't do was grammar. Um, when he was supposed to pick the noun phrases in a sentence, he would be trying to auditorily rehearse a noun phrase as a person, place, or thing, a noun phrase as a person, place, or thing, and then he would try to read a sentence, the dog chased the cat, and he would be trying to keep those two auditory things in his head, and he couldn't do that. So we visualize the grammar. So a noun phrase is a person, a place, or a thing. So what thing is in there? Or it can be an abstraction like satisfaction. So we basically 
visualized grammar for him. Then he could just hold the card under the sentence and say, okay, the, no, it's not a person, place, or thing. Dog, yes, so that's a noun. Cage, yes, that's a thing. Um, so basically he could use that visual um, to figure out what things in the sentence were nouns versus verbs, etc. Um, and then being the visual dyslexic that he is, once he put these in visual memory, then he didn't need the cards anymore after just a few weeks of practicing with the cards. He had those visual pictures in his head and then he could do it independently. So anyway, um, so we've got those noun cards. Here's the verb card. We've got some movie producer filming the action over here. So a verb is very action or a state of being. And then we have preposition, which is basically going to be some sort of a position like over or down or across or up or through, etc. Or some time, like since or after. Okay, so again, these are just examples. The dog eats bones. My brother smells funny. Her ball is in the yard. We love grammar. All of those things follow that basic phrase structure sentence. Um, modal verbs are something that can be inserted into the verb phrase. So we can have auxiliary, he is eating. We can have progressive, has been eating. Or we can have these modal verbs, should have been, could have been, etc., etc. So the modal verb system. Modal verbs most people don't recognize are just another one of the, you know, helping verbs and they do they do not have a future tense. When you say what's the future tense in English, will we say like will or might or one of those kinds of things. Well, that's not a tense of the verb. It's actually the meaning of the root word. So the meaning of the root word means something in the future. But these modal verbs have their own present and past tense. So the present tense of can is can. What's the past tense of can? Could. The present tense of shall is shall. The past tense is should. The present tense of will is will. The pan ten past tense is would. The present tense of may is may. The past tense is might. The present tense of must is must. The past tense is must. So that one doesn't change phonologically. Okay, so basically these are all verbs that have a present tense and a past tense. The notion of future comes from the definition, the semantic definition of the word. And there are all sorts of, they're different in terms of probability. Can means you're capable. Shall means that you're, you know, committed to. Will means that, you know, you're going to, you know, do it. May means you may or may not. Must means there's some sort of force behind it. Um, so anyway, those are get their sense of future from the semantics of the word and not from any future verb tense. We don't have future tense in English. And then we have a quasi-modal um, that's used when it needs a placeholder in the sentence, so do versus did. That can be a vocabulary word on its own or it can, you know, so it can be the verb on its own, or it can serve as also the modal. So I do, my homework is basically the vocabulary word do, but if I say I do have homework, then it's going to be the modal before the word have, more information than you probably want. Anyway, so modal verbs. It communicates a sense of, fu of future but it's basically not a future tense verb. The tenses are simple present and past. All right, now, all of those sentences that we looked at at a third grade level of and above go beyond the simple sentence. So here's the simple sentence. The dog is barking, the dog is jumping. Now we have to do what Chomsky called transformations. We basically have to use some rules 
in order to combine our sentences. And these rules are what children have difficulty with when they have difficulty processing grammar. Um, so the dog is barking, the dog is jumping. We can delete anything that's the same. So let's delete it. And then we can combine them with a conjunction. The dog is barking and jumping. So that's a pretty simple transformation. So that's the conjunction. We have some that are just additive like and. We have some that are aversative like but. Okay, so there's different kinds. Causative, because. All right, clausal movement. We showed you several examples of clausal movement. We have things that are in the, you know, the basic sentence is going to be a subject and a predicate. And then we have prepositions and adverbs and whole other sentences that we can add to that basic sentence, um, or they become part of that basic sentence. And we can move prepositions, we can move adverbs, or we can move whole sentences in front of our basic sentence. So the dog barks early every morning is going to be an adverbial phrase, and we can move that adverbial phrase early every morning the dog barks. Here's another adverbial phrase, quickly. Quickly the boy runs. Here's a prepositional phrase. In the pond the frog jumped. I can do add a whole other sentence. Because the frog was hungry, he jumped in the pond for food. So I could take the sentence, the frog jumped in the pond for food because he was hungry, and I could move the whole sentence. Because he was hungry for food, he jumped in the pond. Anyway, so that's clausal movement, where for emphasis, in meaning, slight change in meaning, we move clauses around. Relative clause subject. The dog ate the bone, and we see that the subject is the same in the second sentence. So this is going to be a subject relative clause. So I'm going to get, first, I can substitute it for a pronoun if I want to. Um, the dog ate the bone, it was hungry, that leaves two sentences. So that's one kind of pronoun that I can use to show that it's the same dog. I'm talking about the dog who ate the bone and it was the same dog that was hungry. So I can use it to make it unambiguous that it's the same dog. Or I can use a relative pronoun to actually embed the sentence inside of the first sentence. The dog, that so instead of he, this time I'm using the relative pronoun that, and I'm going to put it right after the subject. The dog that was hungry ate the bone. These are going to throw kids if they don't have these grammatical structures, relative clauses. This is where you start getting the funny intonation. This is where you start getting the pausing in the wrong place. This is where you start getting the lack of comprehension. Okay, now these come in at first grade reading. Um, by the time you're in fourth and fifth grade reading, there's multiple examples of these in one single sentence. So first, second graders handle, you know, one of one or two of these kinds of clauses. Um, but kids with delays are already struggling with them because remember, they don't even have them in their oral language, according to Loban. Relative clause object. So now, the object of the sentence, the boy, matches the subject of the next sentence. So this is going to be an object clause, where the object matches the subject of the next sentence. So I can get rid of that one. I could use just a pronoun, a regular pronoun. It still leaves it as two sentences. The dog barked at the boy he was playing. But if I want to combine them, I have to come over and use a relative pronoun. The dog barked at the boy. This time it's a human, so I'm going to choose who from my choices. Who was playing. And now the object of the sentence becomes the subject of the next sentence in one sentence by using that relative pronoun. These get even trickier now for kids. The relative clause with ellipsis. Ellipsis means that you've deleted the clause marker from the sentence. You can't hear it or see it anymore. So let's look at what I'm talking about. The dog ate the bone. I like the dog. So now this time the subject of the sentence and the object of the second sentence match. So it's a third pattern. Okay, I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to 
mark it with a that. So the dog ate the bone, the dog I like. And now I'm going to move the I like up there. And now I'm going to do the ellipsis. The dog I like ate the bone. Okay, and you can see that there is this complex structure because there's two verbs sitting next to each other. Like is a verb and ate is a verb. And you can't have that. A simple sentence has one verb. And this is what's going to throw the kids off. We've got the dog, no verb. I like a verb. And now another crazy verb. If they don't understand the structure, they're going to lose the meaning. They're going to lose fluency and not be able to you know, handle this. So basically, it's another pattern that they're not finding. And you can see how they're going to completely lose I like ate the bone. That doesn't even make any sentence, any sense in the sentence. So they're likely to start changing it. Um, I can't even think of something that works. Um, I like any bones. So they'll start miscuing, putting in words to try to make sense of it. Another kind of clause is the infinitive clause. The dog wants the cat. The dog chases the cat. So it's the subject of the sentence that's the same, and also the object of the sentence that's the same. Notice that one of the verbs is a mental verb. It's one of those theory of mind verbs. You have to think about the dog's mind. What? Why is he chasing the cat? Well, because he wants the cat. So this is a physical verb, chase. This is a mental verb, wants. So very often in infinitive clauses, you're putting the mental clause or the mental verb and the physical verb together. So let's see how that's done. I'm going to get rid of the object or the subject clause. I'm going to get rid of the object clause. And that's just going to leave the two verbs. Now I'm going to combine them using an infinitive transformation. The infinitive to, you see the word to on here, where you insert another verb, to plus a verb. He wants to chase the cat. And you lose the s because the noun verb agreement goes back to this part of the sentence. The dog wants to chase the cat. So now we've got our two verbs together separated by that infinitive to, which a lot of people, you know, we're going to think of as a preposition, but it's not. To the cat would have been a preposition. To chase is this infinitive. So this is going to throw off kids because they start reading it as if it's a prepositional phrase. And you're going to see that loss of fluency, funny phrasing, um, loss of comprehension. We also have very various phrases various forms of noun phrase complements. I know something, the dog is hungry. So we end up with something being a pronoun. We're going to get rid of that pronoun and put in the relative pronoun that. I know that the dog is hungry. So that's another type of structure. Or WH adverbial, we saw lots of those kinds of clauses. I know when to feed him. So it might be a how, when, um, where, or some sort of comparative. I know when to feed him. I know how to feed him. I know why to feed him. All right. So when I'm working with kids, I use my little visual grammar card. And we talk about, you know, the subject of the sentence and the predicate of the sentence. And we talk about, you know, these different kinds of things. A, a noun is a person, place, or thing, and so is a pronoun. Only the pronoun points to the noun that's in another part of the sentence, or it's in another sentence somewhere else. So a pronoun is just a filler. It's a word that isn't the, the noun, but it fills in for the noun. It, it says the same thing as the noun, so that you don't have to keep saying the dog, the dog, the dog, the boy, the boy, the boy. You can say it or he or she. Um, then we talk about adjectives where we add, you know, things like number or color or size or shape or feelings or different kinds of things that talk about the noun. So that's our adjective. Our adverb is going to talk about, it's going to add information to our verb. So something about the how or the where or the time or a comparative kind of thing. Um, and then the preposition, that's going to give us some information about the position. Is it under, over, around, through, 
um, you know, those kinds of things. Or is it a time relationship like since or after? Lots and lots of prepositions in our language. Sometimes it's really surprising which words can function as prepositions. So that's our noun phrase and some of the things we can add to our noun. There's our verb and some of the things we can add to or after the verb. Now, if I want to create compound or complex sentences, my big choices are going to be I can use a relative pronoun to create a relative clause. That could be in the subject, the object, it can be ellipsis. The infinitive verb, the WH adverbial clause, or my conjunction. So those are the ways that I can actually add things into my sentence to put two sentences together or to put two verbs together within my sentence. So I give them this visual chart that they can use to make these decisions. By the way, they teach the way they teach grammar in school, where you have to diagram sentences or you have to read sentence after sentence and find the nouns and the verbs. There is not a single study ever, and there have been like 70 years worth of studies, not a single study has shown that the way that we teach grammar in school has any positive effect on reading, on writing, or oral language. Zero. Not a single study. Sentence combining does have a positive effect, so when they teach kids to do sentence combining, it does have a positive effect, and yet we keep t torturing kids with grammar, using those grammar books year after year after year, especially our low kids who are not metasyntactically aware, um, and so they're just struggling, etc. But if we use it in living language, then we actually can make some strong impacts on kids. So... This is a PowerPoint we're going to send you. Um, and it basically is designed, it was one that I did, it was designed to help children see these kinds of patterns. So, when I'm working with kids, we read through the sentence together. One spring day, Danny was playing with his friends who lived down the street, Zach and Mark. And now what we're going to call, the literature calls, unpacking the sentence. So we're going to go, Danny was playing, and that's a full sentence, so I show my board and I say, okay, what is this? Is this a noun phrase or a verb phrase or a sentence? And so they have to look. Does it have the character? Does it have, you know, the action? Um, and if it has these two things, then it's a sentence. So Danny was playing. And then with who? With his friends. So we go back and we look at the board. And what do you think? How did I add with his friends in there? Is this a relative clause? Is this an infinitive clause? At first, they're just looking at me like, ah, oh, more of this. I hate this stuff. Um, but, you know, the visuals give them a way of thinking about it. So when we look at the choice of prepositions, okay, is it something that's, you know, in a position? Are you next to or you know, with or under or whatever. And they start seeing these words that tell me that I was able to add this information to this sentence using that prepositional phrase. And then when? One spring day. So then we start, start talking about it and it's like, okay, one spring day. Are we talking about his friends? Are they one spring day? Or are we talking about playing? Is that when he did it? They were, you know, playing when one spring day so this is going to hook to the verb so that's going to be an adverb all right so Danny was playing with his friends one spring day so we've figured out our sentence and now we're going to look at the transformation so I can move clausal movement if I wanted to talk about this the day first and talk about when he was doing this action, I can move that adverbial phrase, you know, to the beginning of the sentence. Now, if I do that, it needs a capital letter and that period, because it used to be at the end of the sentence, now becomes the first clause. So it's going to change into a comma. One spring day, Danny was playing with his friends. And we've gone from the simple sentence into the transformed version of it with clausal movement. His friends lived, and so here's our second sentence. So we can put our sentence marker if we want to. I don't know if I did it or not. Could have put my sentence marker here. His friends, there's my noun, there's my verb, so that's a sentence. Lived, and this time down the street. How did I add down to this? So we can look at our different 
pictures and we see that the preposition has a down on it down the street. So this got added through the prepositional phrase. And then we can read the whole thing. One spring day, Danny was playing with his friends. His friends lived down the street. Now we're going to try to put those two sentences together. So I say look for the words that are the same in the two sentences. And so they'll look at it and they'll find out that his friends occurs in the object position over here and it occurs in the subject position over here. So us as speech language pathologists know that this is going to be a relative clause object. I don't get that much detail with the kids. We just call it a relative clause. Anyway, so we talk about, you know, instead of saying his friends, his friends, his friends, we can use a pronoun. And I'm going to combine the sentences. So the pronoun that I'm going to choose is going to be not a plain pronoun. So we'll look at our choices. Does the plain pronoun allow you to combine the sentences? No, that leaves it as two sentences. But I can use the special kind of pronoun, the relative pronoun. And because it's a human, I'm going to use who out of my choices. And now I've got my sentence. One spring day, Danny was playing with his friends who lived down the street. So by going through this process and talking and talking and talking and making decisions and using the visual grammar cards to kind of look at what my choices are when I'm trying to combine the sentences, they very quickly start to learn these patterns. Now we've got a third part of the sentence. His friends were Zach and Mark. What words are the same in my sentences? His friends occurs again. Okay, so that's there so I can get rid of it. This time I'm going to use an appositive structure. So I could use a conjunction or I could use a relative clause. This time I'm going to take out that word, but if I take out a word I need to mark it with a comma. So now I'm going to move it into place. And I've completed my sentence, so I can put um, my punctuation mark in there. And we can look at that a positive structure. A positive structures, remember, give you a little more information about something. And so his friends are actually Zach and Mark. So it's giving you a little more information about who his friends who lived down the street were. They were Zach and Mark. So that's my positive structure. And then we read it. One spring day, Danny was playing with his friends who lived down the street, Zach and Mark. Now you can hear their intonation improving because they see how, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, they see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Here's just another one quickly, the three boys, here's past perfect, had played two rounds of basketball, the three boys had eaten lunch. The three is the same in both. Boys is the same in both. Had is the same in both. So I can use a conjunction to put them together. But um, because it's not the last string, I'm going to substitute the comma for my conjunction. And now I've got the three boys had played two rounds of basketball, eaten lunch. And I'm going to add the third sentence, the three boys. Past perfect had played a video game. The three is the same in both. Boys is the same in both. Had is the same in both. I'm going to combine it again with a conjunction. But this time the conjunction is going to stay since it's the last in the series. Three boys had played two rounds of basketball, eaten lunch, and played a video game. And then there's the picture of the three actions. Anyway, the PowerPoint takes you through these sentences, and then after you've finished a paragraph, it puts it together into the coherent paragraph. One spring day, Danny was playing with his friends who lived down the street, Zach and Mark. The three had played two rounds of basketball, eaten lunch, and played a video game about a sheik and a prince who battled each other. As he watched the prince beat the sheik, Mark announced he was tired of playing, and his brother, who usually disagreed with Mark, except when it came to shooting basketballs, concurred that he too was tired. So this one's written, you know, about um, 
the fifth to sixth grade reading level. I use it with everybody from fourth grade on um, because again I'm guiding them all the way through. I don't expect them to read it independently. So this was a quick study that this was the study that we did a couple of years ago um, where we basically got their scores on the told. So we use the told I we did eight weeks of intervention when we went in twice weekly into the classroom and did this with the whole class as opposed to a second class where we did not do this. Um, the mean correct responses increased from 10 to 15 points from pre to post test and those gains were significant at the 0.001 level. When we looked at comprehension of the grammatical sentences it went from 9 to 17 points. The you know, the um, comprehension went up enormously on standardized scores. And you don't get changes in standardized scores in eight weeks, but we got these enormous changes in standardized scores at a 0 .009, highly, highly, highly significant level. Okay, um, we also got better word recognition. So we got statistically significant increases in word recognition for both graded word lists and for words read accurately within passages. So it also bumped just word recognition. The lowest readers averaged a grade level of increase in their reading passage level between pre and post test. Um, and then on when we compared their iLeap scores, so we did this in January and February, when we looked at their iLeap scores in third grade compared to their iLeap scores following our intervention. Um, these represented an significant change so that the kids were you know almost in the unsatisfactory to almost barely crossing over into approaching basic and the in class as a whole moved up to the basic level. But understanding individual sentences is not enough. We also need to look at the connections between them and that's just this real quick thing I want to talk about in terms of text cohesion. Um, there's five kinds. Reference, I have a new dog. It refers back to dog. So this is a cohesive tie. It tells me it's not a new dog. It's the one I just talked about. It has long ears. That, that is a cohesive tie talking back to long ears. That makes it cute. So that's called reference. So this is another aspect of syntax that you have to understand that these kinds of pronouns are going to point back to information usually earlier in the sentence or in pre previous sentences. Substitutions is when you use a term like one or that's the same or do, I do, I do too, um, to refer back to another information. So he likes ice cream, I do too. I'm getting a puppy, I want the brown one. One is going to stand for puppy. Did the puppy eat today? It did yesterday. So did stands in for eat. If so, if eating yesterday is the case, then let it out. And it is going to be the puppy, which is reference. Okay, so these are just examples of reference cohesion. Julie had trained for months for this race and she, Julie, hoped she, Julie, and Julie's dogs would win. Once one of the sled's runners slid into a hole and broke. Julie could have given up then but she, meaning Julie, didn't. She, Julie, fixed it, meaning the runners, and they, meaning her and her dogs, kept going. So sometimes the cohesive tie points back to things in the same sentence or the sentence immediately before, but it could be something in a different paragraph. Conjunctions also are cohesive ties. They tie ideas together throughout the passage. Words that are related to each other tie things together through the passage. So puppy and barked go together. Paw goes back to puppy. He was caught in the thing and the general word thing okay, um, is going to refer back to something that happened somewhere else. So there was something earlier in the story that would identify what a thing is. Ellipsis is when we saw this in syntax. Ellipsis is when the word is completely eliminated. Two puppies saw an alligator, one puppy ran away. And so basically I can just say one ran away and that's an ellipsis 
took out the word puppy. All right, so this is just an example of how cohesion works. Reference will be red, substitution blue, conjunction green, lexical orange, ellipsis purple. One day her teacher said, Carmen, so this time the pronoun is used before the noun. Her is referring forward to Carmen. Are you, meaning Carmen, all right? All right is a term that basically is going to be thematically talked about throughout the passage. I is part of the contraction, meaning teacher. I've noticed you, meaning Carmen, squinting. So squinting and all right are going to be lexically tied. So that's a lexical related words kind of thing. Being all right and squinting means not all right. Are you Carmen having trouble seeing. So seeing and squinting and all right are part of this lexical theme that's developing. So we start to comprehend because of these lexical words that help us start to develop the theme. I could have put trouble up here next to all right because that's following that theme of you know something being wrong. Carmen shook her, meaning Carmen. I'm fine, meaning Carmen. Mrs. Cruz going back to teacher, she, going back to Carmen, said, but she, Carmen, knew she, Carmen, was not fooling, fooling and squinting in trouble, etc., are all following this lexical theme, her, meaning the teacher. Here's an ellipsis. We looked at that kind of sentence where the that relative pronoun doesn't have to appear. She knew she was not fooling her. So that's an example of an ellipsis that can throw off kids. I, meaning Carmen, really do. And do is referring, it's one of those <coughs> substitution words um, in terms of I really do have difficulty. So are you having trouble? And she's like, I really do have trouble seeing. So that's a word that's a substitution word, she thought to herself. At home, she had to sit closer and closer, which is following the theme to the television. Here's the conjunction in order. Here's the infinitive to see it. Um, but the real sentence is she was sitting closer to the television to see it. So that got elided from the surface. Her mother noticed her meaning Carmen, squinting, follows the theme as she watched, follows the theme, her favorite, etc. So you can see how children have to follow those these cohesive ties and keep track of how what the pronouns are referring to. Every bad reader I've ever worked with has trouble following the cohesion of pronouns. We work with them when they're little. We work with them in terms of gender, he, she. We work with them in terms of subject, object, he, him. We don't work on them in terms of cohesion and following the cohesion across the boundaries of sentences and paragraphs. Kids are losing comprehension like crazy because they can't follow these cohesive ties. Okay, now you can use the PowerPoint we're going to send you. Um, and we're going to send you a bunch that are written at different grade levels. Um, but you can use any reading passage. So any reading passage is going to have these complex sentences and these cohesive ties. So you can, you know, just read anything with your kids and work on this complex language. Talk about, oh, look, one day you can use the grammar cards we're going to send you. One day, that's been moved. See that? Um, comma, that means it used to be at the end of the sentence somewhere and it's been moved to the front of the sentence. All of the animals of the forest gathered together in a clearing one day. Um, so there's lots of, you know, whatever you pick up, you can work on how to unpack this complex language and how to process that language. Here's a way to that I do it visually all the time. I just have my whiteboard there and I just start putting these boxes of information. Here's the sentence. When she raced up four flights of stairs to the bedroom, she got there before her sister. So we put those connecting words that basically signal transformations. When she raced up four flights of stairs, here's the preposition to her bedroom. She 
Here's the she got there. Here's the conjunction before her sister. And then we can talk about how the real sentence was actually this before her sister's when she raced up four flights of stairs. And so we basically can talk about how this part of the sentence, I'm sorry, this part of the sentence got moved to the front, and when that happened, we marked it with a comma. So I can even use note cards, etc., so that I can actually physically put them at the end of the sentence and then move them to the front of the sentence. So visualizing, visualizing, visualizing helps children to start to see these patterns. It does not take very long. Once children see these patterns and start to understand how they work, then you have the rules of grammar that you need for this higher level reading. So, unfortunately our current models of reading pay only surface superficial attention to the language basis of reading fluency and comprehension. We as speech language pathologists have the skills to understand and to begin to work on the actual language basis of comprehension. Um, in a reading for syntactic and morphological awareness are critical elements that we can do. These are skills that we have. We just have to recognize how badly and desperately they're needed and strategies we can use to actually accomplish it, as well as the discourse needs. So <clears throat> by reading, we can also be using our storyboards and other you know visuals to help them keep the whole story going, whether it's narrative or expository text. And don't forget, and readability is your helper. It's your friend. It's easy to calculate, calculate, especially with the computerized formulas. And that tells you what's great appropriate syntax. Okay, so it's like, well, where do I start? Well, you have to figure out what the read, what your child can read and where they start to fail to read. And that'll be that readability level. And then basically your objectives become they'll be able to read the syntactic complexity and comprehend the syntactic complexity at a third grade readability level or a fourth grade readability level or a fifth grade readability level. So basically that becomes your IEP goal is to be able to handle the syntactic and, and morphological and semantic complexity at that readability level. Then it can be useful in selecting your materials to make sure that you're, you know, working above their mastered level but not too high so that there's too many things that they can't process. You can use it for progress monitoring and it's something that's already been validated as very accurate and reliable. Um, so, but you just have to stick with the same measure. So some of the measures give you some different outcomes, so you just have to stick with that same, whatever you choose a formula, keep using that formula. And those are some of the references. So thank you for participating today. Um, I hope that you um, enjoy working with your kids on these more complex language forms. Um, I'm hoping some of the tools that we'll send you will make it easier and you know, guide you through the process until you're comfortable dealing with these high-level language um, abilities. Thank you.